Women need to get rich, get rich and invest their money in backing other women. What is failure anyway? You know, I think we kind of need to redefine what that means. Love home swapping five years later, I sold it for X. And then there's what actually happened. Did you set up Love Home Swap knowing you were going to sell it? I've only ever done things knowing I'm going to sell them. Entrepreneurship can be the most amazing path to upside and getting rich. Let's not forget to talk about that. Things I never seem to learn is that you sell the dream and say you hire in a hurry. At every stage, and it's what I'm going through now, have an existential crisis. Yes. For me at that time, I'd just given away half my money. I can't want it back. So we'll just go straight into it. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Grace. I'm very excited to talk to you. Um, we've had some in-depth conversations over dinner. We've had some in-depth conversations in a business and speaker setting. Um, I feel like this will be a, a good middle of ground. Yeah, it's different. Also, I'm not wearing sequins. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was the first time we probably Yeah. Met. Sorry about that. No, don't but never apologize for sequins. <laughs> I feel like apologizing for sequins is a is a bad thing to do. I feel like that's not a rule. Um I'd like to go back to the very beginning to get a bit of context on you, your life, your upbringing, what led to you even starting your first business. Could you start at the beginning and just tell me a little background? Okay. Um so I grew up in Yorkshire, which mm -hmm. you wouldn't gather anymore, no. given my extremely posh accent. My dad's the same. There you he are. is um, from it's Southport and has, 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 yeah, <laughs> has like a very posh London accent <laughs> until he says Bath. Yeah, well, no, I do. I'm Bath actually. Like, oh. My siblings are Bath, which they find, you know, <laughs> Um Anyway, so I grew up in a Jewish immigrant family, third generation immigrant family, and it was a sort of classic immigrant upbringing in the sense that there were a couple of things which if you try and look back on why you've had this funny life and I have had a very funny work life, I think some of it's just um, focused on what you know and mm -hmm. what you grew up with and what you feel comfortable with. So the two main things for me, I think, were no one in my family had a proper job. Mm -hmm. Everybody worked for themselves. They wouldn't have called themselves entrepreneurs because right. that's quite a fancy word, but they were business owners and those businesses were super humble, right? So my grandparents, sold fruit and veg in Sheffield Market. On the other side, my grandfather, who died quite young, and my grandmother ran a chain of sweet shops and off licenses across the north of England. So what does that mean? I think it means you talk about work around the table, you talk about money a mm -hmm. lot, and that's not considered a sort of gauche thing. And the, the female role models in my life were really extraordinary women who yeah. had a lot of children. Mm -hmm and worked for themselves. And my grandmother who died at 97, um, having outlived a number of husbands, uh, which I can only aspire to, um, <laughs> was an amazing woman in many ways, um, in that she she ran businesses, she was a terrible driver, that's something her and I have in common. And my formative memories as a child were driving around with her in her armored van, dropping cash off at the bank. She never learned to reverse, by the way. I'm not very good at reversing. <laughs> so relate. Uh, and my mother ran her own business as well. So I think some of it is, you have to see it to be it. It normalizes talking about business yeah. and money. You don't see anyone going off to work for a big company. That just mm. really wasn't a thing. Yeah. And I think the other thing, which um, you might recognize a bit, Grace, is academic excellence was sort of non-negotiable. Right. Um, it was really, really, really important yeah. to excel and be interested and be interested in the world. So uh -huh. we always talked a lot about, as well as business, politics and books, and that was the thing. So, you know, it was a noisy, argumentative, feisty sort of upbringing. But if I look at my siblings, and depending on how you cut it, divorcing, remarrying is kind of a theme in my family. There are seven of us in total. And the majority of my siblings work for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, if I sort of take them in order, my next sister, Down, is an entrepreneurial psychotherapist. And then my brother, Ben, I work with in Love Homes, which I'm sure we'll get to. So in the kind of nature-nurture debate, I think family normalizing talking about how money gets made and spent mm. is really important. Yeah, and I think so un-British as yes, we see it. Yes, it was a very un-British like, family. I That's right. never talked about, and I don't think, well, 
my family did talk about money in a way, but it would only ever be when it was, I'd say in a bad way, I'd yeah. say, as in like, and I also would say as a result of that, it, you know, you it, just you having this, I guess, l lack of emotional connection to it. It's more just like, this is what happens. This is how you earn it. This is how it, you know, goes out. This is what you need to do to, you know, for the business to thrive, whatever it might be. Just like an honest conversation about yeah, money rather I've than being- I've always been very unemotional about money. Right. And I, and I think it stems from that. And I'm really conscious of it with my own children that I also think it's important that they understand how it gets made and spent. Yes. And that they don't have fear or anxiety or shame or Britishness around the concept of talking about what things cost and how we pay for them. Again, in my family, that would never have been framed as a thing, mm -hmm. but I think it's just a consequence yeah. of how these immigrant families who arrive here with nothing work. Of course. And I think somehow then that makes the journey that you have to go through as an entrepreneur and as a young entrepreneur as you have been a lot easier because mm -hmm. I don't think you have any fear, Yeah. right? Um, but also I think some of the tough stuff that really is critical to your success, which is being able to negotiate, being able to ask for money, being able to ask men for money, being able to mm. negotiate a term sheet, being able to say, no, that's not okay. I think that was easier to right. some extent, just having grown up with a lack of emotional connection around a sort of personal balance sheet. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And just before we move on from that, I'd love to know what you try to do then with your children. You mentioned then in a way that they can understand the comings and goings and how to, not necessarily sitting them down and teaching them how to negotiate, but just like that type of attitude towards money and business. How do you kind of impart that on them? I mean, this makes me sound like a bit of a nutter, but um, my children had a strange childhood anyway. Mm -hmm. so I think if you grow up, with a mum who's an entrepreneur and I was a single mum with yeah. my two kids from them being a very young age. I think you're you're in the mix when it comes to business in lots of different ways. I've always just had to take them with me. Sure. When they, this doesn't mean, I don't mean this to sound macho, but if you're an entrepreneur and you're running a business and you have a child, you, the child has to kind of come with yeah. you, right? Yeah, so yeah, I've always done slightly weird things like, and in particular, I can remember closing a transaction and turning up to a very fancy law firm with a baby that I was breastfeeding where all of the male um, lawyers had sort of had a heart attack about that. And that was a while ago. So I think it's become yeah. more normal. So they've always been in the mix when it comes to work. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? My son who's 14 is a mini entrepreneur with all that goes with that. Although I would um, have to mark his homework on his execution. So he, I'd say that he's um, very good at um, imagining a concept and marketing, but he hasn't quite figured out how to produce a product yet. So i give you the four examples. He's quite obsessive. So he became very obsessive last year about chilies. Okay. Right, he felt that there was a gap in the market for homegrown chilies. And because he's kind of used to that being a thing, he set up, um, little, we live in Little Venice, littlevenicechilicompany.com, bought the URL. He produced a load of um, posters, <laughs> which he put up around the neighbourhood, people a bit more used to him. And we had to set up a sort of chilli growing empire on the roof. <laughs> so the, the two things he had thought about was one, the birds ate all the, right, the chilies. And two, he'd like massively oversold the dream and yet there was no pipeline to producing the product. So, right. Uh, right. So we we do... I important mean, learning. It's very, very important, important learning. So you're better off learning that talk. before you've invested into it. So, you know, the chilies, 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 chilies was all we talked about for about three months. So what's my point, apart from my son is eccentric? I think that they're used to that being okay, because, and, and you all know this, Grace, that we get overtaken as entrepreneurs by the idea and by a passion and by yeah. a thing and doesn't always stick, right? And sometimes you've just got to throw a load of stuff at the wall, whether it's chilies or... And I think that they find that process sort of normal. Mm -hmm. I think what's also, as you get a bit older, you remember things that people have said to you. A lot of these things came from my grandmother who was extremely blunt. But she, w she said to me at quite a young age, you like nice things, which I do. Yeah. I like shoes yeah. and dresses and things right yeah so you know. better earn your own money mm -hmm. if you want to pay for them and then the other thing she always said which is a consequence of the sort of divorcing that goes on in our family is always have your fuck you money in a bank yes account, right and and i think i was probably eight so right yeah, yeah. your grandma's like get yeah, your fuck felt, you pocket money a bit young but i think there's a point around that yeah which is around 
something that's been an extremely important thing to me for better for worse which is to be independent always yeah. to make your own decisions as my mother would say you know you do what you want Deborah you always do and she's sort of right so I think I try with the kids a if no one wants to be obsessed with chilies he's got to earn the money to buy the chilies and live right. the consequences yeah. of the chilies screwing up which they did but it's it's fine to do that but two is to remind them that they have an extremely nice life as a consequence of my graft. Right. And they shouldn't take that for granted. And yes. there is an expectation that they will be aware of that, not in a kind of annoying way, but just to, I think that it's really important. There's yeah. a connection in their mind between work and output. Yeah, and I also think that that's often framed in, an, like, that's not a negative, that's a very kind thing to do to children, to give them a very representative and self-aware upbringing. I hope so. I mean, look, they roll their own. I'm not saying Yeah, they, yeah, they, no, yeah. No, 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 of That's course. Brilliant. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Clearly from now, they're becoming teenagers, they find it annoying. But I think you do, and maybe it's a consequence of our work life, Grace, that you are forced to think a bit about, well, why am I this mm -hmm. way? Or what yeah. are things that people have said along the way? And I think those formative moments for women around independence, commerce, ownership, and ambition, are really important mm. and they made a big difference to my life. I couldn't agree more. And so what was your first job? Um, well, I worked in Benetton and mm -hmm. Whistles. So I'm a sh I think you're either as a young person, woman, person, a shop assistant or a waitress, <laughs> you were in my day, and I was a shop assistant, not Yeah, a or a, bar, a, a yeah, cafe yeah, exactly. barista. Like, well, like one, so I've always done shops, I still do, it's my joke with Anna, my business partner, that I'm always um, a cheap stylist, and in fact, on the way over here, um, as well as buying my own shoes and net porter sale, um, I sent Anna a few links of things I thought she would look good. <laughs> I love that. And I also would like to be added to the distribution list no, for yes, that you may. Thank you. She's also like a size six in a very annoying way. So right. you know how those Yeah, yeah, you're like, there. cool. <laughs> you're on the shelf. Cool. I was like, I would look awful in that, but you would look amazing. So I was a shop assistant. That means I'm very good at folding jumpers and my wardrobes are always immaculate, mm. but I've always worked. I mean, I, I had, you know, Saturday jobs from the age of sort of 13, 14. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think that the, the inner shop assistant is always still there. Mm, for sure. And then, so you went to university. I did, yeah. Did you do anything, would you say, kind of entrepreneurial before this stage? Did it all start after the, your university? No, degree? so my big thing that I did at school um, was Young Enterprise, and I mm -hmm. was indeed the national winner of Young Enterprise. Well, congratulations. Sure and my business, which was very 80s, because it was the 80s, um, was selling scrunchies, although they're back, so there you are. They are back. Um, and you can start a, again, in the new venture. <laughs> I haven't really thought about that. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, yeah, and, and we, you know, and it became a thing and the scrunchies got sold and as do locally and we did a thing, all that sort of stuff. Incredible. Yeah, so, we, so we sort of knocked it out of the park, or I was at an all-girls school, and so the all-girls scrunchie collected. So no, I think, and I think I was 14 or 15 at that time. Um, and at university, look, I did lots of stuff and I was at a very privileged university and I, ran the student newspaper and mm. I was part of the union and, and lots of things like that. Um, I think I've always felt like you have to just suck the marrow out of life mm -hmm. and that's a big thing for me. Um, I had I used to have a sort of standing joke with my ex-husband about things that people would never say about you and mine uh, sorry, things that you would never say about yourself. Mm -hmm. And mine was I'm just gonna lie down and flop. Right. And um, so you know I like to be doing and I think that that tenant of being close to business and a big part of that of that for me is just about being around really cool smart people with yes. lots of ideas yes I'm an extrovert I'm crap on my own really mm -hmm. I like to be in the room yeah um sometimes after a lot of in the room I'm a bit like yeah. out of conversation but I do like to be in the room and I definitely come up with my best ideas through bouncing them off other right. people. And that's always been the case. Mm. So a big part of being at university, and I did a very sort of weirdy subject, philosophy and theology, and that's, a lot of reading. And, I actually applied and for philosophy and theology. There you are. Uh, you know, <laughs> some similarities and There here. you are. So you know what that's like. So there's a lot of that, isn't there? And in, and to recover from the that, I have to right. be doing that. Yes. And that's always Lots been of the way thinking and philosophy and theology. Yeah. So interesting. So when you came out of university, what was your, what did you think that your job was going to be? So, I mean, again, this is a sort of fairly standard thing from the university that I went to, but the absolutely prevailing wisdom at the time was that you would do milk round interviews for either 
investment banking or management consultancy or council mm -hmm. or law. Um, so the work experience I did in my second year at university was in an investment bank. I absolutely hated it. I worked on the trading floor. Um, I was told sort of on the first day, and again, this was the early 90s, that I had nice legs, so I wasn't permitted to wear trousers ever again. And, you know, it was like a sort of standard trading floor in 1994. Oh, my God. So I felt like that wasn't going to be my thing. No. <laughs> um, and I went into management consultancy. I did the milk round. I had five offers. I took the one that paid the most money. I think I very firmly felt like I wanted to learn some stuff with a view to setting up my own business. Right. And it was a really great first job. Although, I mean, life comes full circle because I now am a senior advisor to McKinsey. But as a young mini management consultant, um, I was quite crap. And yeah. I think that there's a lesson in that about doing something that you're not very good at. Mm -hmm. I'd always knocked it out of the park in life right. and academically and all of that. And I joined a management consultancy as only one of two women and in the intake of 20 and the only arts graduate. And I found it really hard. Really? really what really what hard. did you find so hard about it? It was just super, super mathematical and analytical. Right. Right. And whilst I kept, I've got enough to be dangerous, there's just no way I was going to be top of the intake alongside yeah. people who'd done engineering and maths. Like, I really wasn't. I was like, yeah. the bottom. I was the person that people didn't want on their team. It's so interesting because obviously, a lot of these places, there was a, I think there was a turn. Um, a few decades ago when it was kind of like we're going to stop only taking people who did like economics and you know like pure, and maths and like purely numbers based stuff because they want diversity of thought and they want people who you know are able to bring more to the table but then I because I kind of thought very much the same at that time I was like I literally will never be able to compete with these people and I saw that as intelligence rather than a difference in strengths and yes, that's, oh, that's because you were more mature than me. Um, <laughs> I felt like, okay, this is what I have to do to prove myself. Right. And I found it super hard. But I think that is such a good life lesson in your first job because I was like, I never want to be here again. Yeah. I never want to be the person where they're picking a team because I've always been team captain and they're like, no, not her. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I think there is a point now when life comes full circle and this job I do for McKinsey where, yes, all of the soft skills around relationships and um, being able to really get to the heart of a commercial problem and problem solving, they're hugely valued, but not when you're just starting out. Yeah. They're not. So I think that made me very resolved after a few years of that to never put myself in that position again. And I think there is a lesson in that about identifying early what your strengths are and playing to them and making sure that you've got people on your team who are good at the things that you are. 100%. Right? And I think I had to learn that by going, okay, I'm in completely the wrong environment for me to shine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's such an important lesson. And how did you get from that point to your first business? So I left consulting and I went to work for um, one of the big communications agencies for the founder. They are amazing jobs to do when you're young. So I will have been 23. I was his bad carrier. I sat in in all sorts of meetings and helped to translate the what and the where with a view to setting up my first business, which I did in 1999. Were you even born then, Grace? So, I was. I was two yes, and I was um, thriving. Okay. So it, it set the scene then. It was dot com one, if you like. I think it was the first time in recent economic history where being young, to our earlier point, um, was really valued. Right, right. Which I think it is an important point. I think it is again now. Right now. I yeah. completely agree with that. And, and as a sort of sidebar to that, as I'm looking in my business life and in um, entrepreneurs that I'm backing and as an investor, that's one of my criteria. Yeah. Um, but before 1999, it really hadn't been. And I think what you saw then was the first wave of young entrepreneurs founding right. those early internet businesses. Yeah. Lastminute.com and Let's Buy It and Yahoo and all those businesses that I kind of grew up in my career with. So it felt like I could launch my first business, which was called Mantra which was a communications and digital marketing agency. I mean, some of the stuff that we did now you would find so painful because this is before yeah. content. Right, before it's the beginning of the whole new language. Before so. like anything. Yeah. You were just about sort of getting some paid media, but not really. It was much more about things like blogging 
and managing online opinion and taking comms online in a really right. linear way. Like, and we were quite early to that. And I was just turning 25 and my business partner was 26. Mm -hmm. And we built this really amazing agency business. And it's a fantastic first business to build because we knew absolutely nothing about running a business. And you, if you're running a business, which is the way you're always two client wins away from greatness and two client losses away from disaster, which is how we operated for the seven years that we ran it. You learn a lot about cash flow and P&L and people and hiring right. and everything. It's a really hands-on business. And some of the disciplines that have held me in very good stead as the businesses that I founded have got bigger and bigger have been about living in cash flow, checking the bank account every day, you know, really figuring out, and I, I'd be interested in your take on this, how to be a leader, and I've got the opposite now, but I was always a leader at a young age mm -hmm. where everybody I employed was older than me, and you need to work out who your corporate self is, and how is that authentic, but is it really on, how do you, it was, we just, and also we had an absolute ball. I mean, bear in mind, we grew the business, the business then fell off a cliff, we grew it again, we sold it to um, the Lowy Group, which is a big marketing services group in 2007, so we were at it for just over seven years. And it was the making of me in, in every way, actually, and um, not just financially, but we screwed up so much stuff. Mm. And, and we, I mean, that first year of, of madness, it's not really like that now, and certainly not now because of, um, you know, we're entering recession, but maybe a couple of years ago where it was reasonably easy to monetize the proposition. And so we had a service office on Brook Street opposite Claridge's, which cost us a fortune. Claridge's was sort of just like a you know, mm. company bar. The time of your life. Yeah. And it was a laugh. Yeah. But you know, we very quickly learned how to really, really run it properly. And all of the things that I think I'm known for and which are a sort of special source around really squeezing results out of a proposition. And I learned the hard way yeah. in that business. That's so interesting that you just went straight into starting a kind of marketing consultancy. I mean, we didn't know anything Oh, yeah. Um, but we had a phone and a computer and quite a lot of chutzpah. Yeah. And, and actually we had, which I think is relevant to the now, we had an address book that was really meaningful in yeah. a way that it just that is very wouldn't important. have been. Yeah. Because even through people that I knew or I'd grown up with or I was at university with who, who have remained great friends, Martha Lane Fox, people like that, we were all kids at the same time. Mm. So actually you could generate a lot of fee income and innovate around proposition with people who felt and looked like you and much yeah. in the same way now as, as people are doing with social and content and innovation and building brands and influences and you know blah, blah, blah. we had a whole different version of that yeah. 20 years ago so we were able to with reasonable confidence give it a go and i think a mantra then mantra which was my first business has always been remained a mantra which is what's the worst that can happen yeah um and the answer when you're 24 25 is not a lot right you do it doesn't work yeah but it's so easy to think that it is because it i think that it i know it doesn't know. matter like you have nothing to lose and when i talk about entrepreneurship particularly female founders which as you know grace is my sort of specialized subject i think that there's such a concern around failure mm. and embarrassment and letting oneself and others down and, and look I'm, I'm also being realistic yeah if you're founding your first business in your 40s as Anna my Albright co-founder did that is extremely brave right she had a massive job she's got kids and a mortgage and a thing and uh, 24 25 yeah it's it, much it, easier to roll the dice it is so interesting and I wonder <sighs> I guess like how, because we all have obviously responsibilities. I feel like when you are young and especially if you don't have dependents and you're in a situation where it's like, as you say, what's the worst that can happen? It's it's a really privileged position to be in, but it's also a very, I guess, how do we get more people to think like that when it's so natural to think about all the responsibilities that you have that actually realistically you could still, you know, make work if everything did go wrong? So I would say two things, people like you, 
Like, that's not blowing smoke, it's just real. I think more role models of young people who are doing it. Also, the thing that didn't really exist um, when I was a girl was the side hustle. Right. And even just sort of chatting a bit when I got here, I think this sort of plural career where people go, well, I do this and I do that. Or, you know, I hosted a thing earlier this week and there were loads of young women in there and I was sort of talking about the same things. And the number of women who are doing a thing that we, we or I would have thought about being the only route at 21 professional services or, uh, mm. but, they, but they have a side hustle of anything whether that's just monetizing their wardrobe or yeah we, d we didn't really have that and so mm. I think that the beauty of what I would have called when I sort of invented it a bit the sharing economy and it is I think that it gives us a softer landing yeah and a jumping off point and I think the recognition that indeed for, for men and women, but women is my dog in the fire, I guess, that we can mentally de-risk it mm. by feeling like we've got more of a safety net. I think we'll get more women to start in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And I think also there is that bias where, you know, when we look at the female funding stats, where we look at, we might as women think that there's less room to fail because it's, I guess, you've got all of that to overturn on your back. So it's like, oh, well, I'm another person proving that, you know, this doesn't work. Whereas actually the amount of, the percentage of failed VC businesses from men will obviously be much higher because it's a much higher percentage. But I guess wanting to prove that something can work because you've got the whole, you know, you've got the whole bias on your back of like yeah. not funding women. Yeah, fuck that though. Yeah. <laughs> Do you really? Like, that's not anyone's personal problem. Yeah. Oh, we have so far to climb, Grace. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we're, if we're at one percent of all capital going to back a female entrepreneur, which is where we are post the pandemic in the UK, and if we're at eighty-nine percent of all capital backing a business co-founded by two, like, I mean, I, I don't need to rehearse them. We can rehearse the stats if you like, but we we know them. I honestly think that the only thing that changes the conversation is more women trying yeah. and more women writing checks. 100%. Like those are the two things. So don't worry about that. And also, what is failure anyway? Mm. You know, I think we kind of need to redefine what that means. And I think in entrepreneurship as well, failure is one of the, like, one of the key things that builds that trust because failure is so inherent in entrepreneurship as like a um you know the way you the way you learn so it might not be a full company failing but as you said with your experience you know you built it up and then it fell off a cliff and then you built it up again and sold it oh, but in everything i've ever done with, exactly yeah you know, there's the story there's the Love home swap and five years later I sold it for X and it did a, and then there's what actually happened, which is a year and a half in the business model was completely broken. Mm. We were down to a thousand pounds in the bank account. We had to and I, I don't know anyone who doesn't have a version of that story. Yeah. It, there are two things. There's how you tell the pixie dust story to the outside world, and then there's what happens when you're really trying to share the real real mm. and the real real involves micro failures every single day it's what mm. you do with them yeah no i think that's so true and i think when you when you see failure as a as a benefit and you see it as a way to further yourself then i think you know you start twisting that and it's not like failure just seeing failure as not bad i think is very important and i don't want to be pollyanna-ish about it i was listening bear grills was interviewed this week <laughs> you can take it a bit far i mean he, i don't know if you heard it he calls his alarm clock his opportunity clock <laughs> <laughs> there are certain things in the law that are just too pollyanna-ish like certain sometimes... things that like sorry <laughs> i do think there are certain things that like men in the public hype like that's shit that's well, allowed to come out well, and it's anyway, like yeah and when we set our opportunity clocks in the morning <laughs> um sometimes you have a shit day and sometimes things go wrong i'm not saying they don't but i am saying that the route to success is littered with things that we now frame as a pivot mm. and pivot which i hate as a word it's just another way of saying yeah failure. Did this thing anyway, yeah right? no i think that's so true so you've sold this business and you obviously well you've been a serial entrepreneur since then you've started a number of different ventures and done a lot very well with a lot of different ventures um what happened in the time after that was there a time that you considered okay maybe i'll take a bit of a break did you think that that was your kind of your career's work at that point what was your where, where was your headspace at after you'd sold that first agency 
Well, I'm not very good at break. Mm -hmm. That make, yep. break makes me anxious. Yes, actually. agreed. Um, I, I can't, I need a thing. So there was never a, a sort of personal or a conversation with myself where A, I was like, I'm done. And B, I thought I'll just, I don't know, exist in a different way. So I think the consequence of starting with all of this young is it does define you. And it's part of what gives you energy even the bad stuff actually. So I think that the die is cast and will always be cast that I need things. Mm -hmm. um, I had a newborn mm -hmm. in 2008. I think I also really didn't want to <laughs> be at home with my newborn as the mm -hmm. only thing I was doing. I just, that's just not me. And yeah. you know. I'm Which I think is really powerful to say. It just isn't. Um, I think that we have been on a great adventure, me and my kids, but it's been an adventure. Yeah. And that's very much how we are together. Um, and I also ended up, I suppose, in that two year period between selling Mantra and starting Love Home Swap, I had a nice time in business. So I teamed up with a guy called Simon Walker. We had a business called Made Film Partners because he lived on Made Avenue and I lived on Thornton Place. I had a child, then I had another child. We um, did advisory work, we invested a lot together. And we also, when we saw an idea that we liked, we put our own money into seeing if we could get it off the ground. So it was a different thing because it wasn't, here is my one thing. It was quite plural. And I think that's also good. And that's yeah. kind of what I'm assessing a little bit now because, you know, what, what are my values? Have fun, make have fun, make money, don't work with assholes. And Love I think that. um haven't always stuck to the third and that is mm. sometimes. I feel like you should difficult. make t-shirts <laughs> or a mug. Um I was really able to do that in that time. And out of that, Love Home Sort was born. I guess the other thing that happened in, in that time, which I you know do talk about very publicly because I think it's important, is that I ended up get getting divorced when my daughter was less than one. So I had a two-year-old and a one-year-old, and I was a single mom, and that really was not the plan. And back yeah. to, I think we're going a bit Elizabeth Day here, but anyway, back to how to fail. Um, I think a bit like the the first job that I was actually crap at, the uh, having a marriage go up in flames with really tiny children was not part of the plan. Yeah. Um, and it was super hard, mm -hmm. but out of that, out of the ashes of that, Love Home Swap was born. And mm. I also think work can absolutely be your salvation. 100%. When things are hard, I think you need purpose. I think you need the promise of the sun, the art plans. I think you need people. I think you need determination. And also you need financial realities. Mm -hmm. And again, do we talk about this enough as founders? I don't know, but for me at that time, I'd just given away half my money and I kind of wanted it back. Yeah. And no one was going to give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> so at, that, at moments like that, you either lie down in the road and cry or you get your ass out, you get your heels on, you get your hair done and you're like, right, I'm back, it's on. I absolutely have to land this. Look, there is a real imperative, that's the point around what might, may or may not matter at 25, at 37 or 8, as I think I was then, it really matters, yeah. right? So I think we should talk about that more. Yeah, Because agree. we're not all doing it for the lols, right? We're doing yeah. it to get rich. Yeah. And women need to get rich. They need to talk about money, get rich, and invest their money in backing other women. Otherwise, we don't change anything. So Love Home Swap, which was a sort of five-year... Um, journey towards selling. I sold it for 53 million to Wyndham. I owned a big chunk of the business. And that had to work. Yeah. And when you decided to start that, how how long after the after you decided to kind of go back to change focus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the the story, the PR story, is also true. So it's yeah, convenient. Great, that, always convenient. It? <laughs> so nice. <laughs> Easier yeah, to practice. Always, but um, the story is this. I was coming back from a holiday when the kids were, Gracie would have been three months. and So um, very fresh as so, well. Yes, yeah, so she was wee and Noah was two. Um, 
And it was one of those holidays, and again, I don't, this may not be your audience, Grace, but for people who do have really young kids, your holidays become shit. Because if you go to a hotel, you just sit in the hotel, eating room service with the sound off, obsessing about feeding and sleeping and all. And we're on the plane on the way home. <laughs> it's very good yeah, birth got control. That <laughs> <laughs> stay on it, stay on the pill. And um, when you get, when, on the way home, uh, with like both children on my seat asleep, I watched the film The Holiday. Mm -hmm. True. Which is not the most amazing film. Oh, I really enjoyed well, it. You are, I'm glad to actually talking about I it last honestly night. Honestly, <laughs> watched that film and spoken over that film mm. playing above my head about 700 times on Brilliant. TV. Mm. But, and I thought, does that even exist? Yeah. Right? I want to be them. Yeah. Actually, I really want to, if you've watched the film, Camera deals swaps with Kate Winslet. They swap their homes, Cotswolds to LA, but they also swap their lives. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to do at that time. Yeah. So I'm like, who am I even with this? Yeah. Wanna, so she, was she fresh out of a breakup as well? She was. They yeah. both, well, they, they both, there you are. So wow. I thought, hmm, does that exist? And then in, I think you all relate. You become very obsessed with this, yes. right? So, or I do, and I think you do a bit. So I got home and I was immediately, does it exist? And I'm like, hmm. It does exist in a sort of people printing out catalogues and sending them, but there's nothing. So this was 2011. Yeah, so well into the There's internet. nothing that felt boutique, um, curated. Safe. Safe, you know, this was the very early days of Airbnb. There was nothing that felt like it would be a choice for people like me, and in particular for people with homes or second homes, who when they went away, both wanted to stay in a home rather than a hotel. Well, that was kind of a new thing, but also wanted to feel like the person whose home they were staying in had some skin in the game. Mm -hmm. And they were also, their own home was also on the site. In other words, in modern parlance, it was a community. Nobody really talked about that then. Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was about that. And so within three months, we had a sort of fairly shit website up. Amazing. And I'd got 250 of my friends to list that. Mm. You have 250 friends. And I am inspired. Friends and friends. And um, the Sunday Times did a thing. And then we were sort of off to the races. Yeah. A, a big part of it was two things that happened that were really important. My brother, Ben, um, was about to go and do an MBA and I dissuaded him from doing that and said, <laughs> Come I have this idea. Yeah. Have. My brother had been head of marketing at um, FT.com, so he Amazing. knew about subscriptions and he's yeah. an all round good, thoroughly awesome human. So Ben came to do it with me. And then when we took it out to raise the first proper venture capital round, and you will be familiar with this too as a sort of uh, polymath. They were like, yeah, 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 it's great. You need to run it mm -hmm. and it needs to be what you do. You can't be doing it and 17 other things as yes. well as we're investing, right? You yes, to, yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, so that was the kind of moment. So 2011 to 2017 um, were the years of growing that. And and also the sharing economy coming of age. And I, mm. and I did a lot of that because I chaired the government review on the sharing economy. I'm the author of the Wasco report. I don't recommend anyone reads it, it's extremely long. Oh, really um, advising the UK government on how to regulate the sort of transition from sharing economy platforms like Airbnb and Uber being caring, sharing, to them hitting some really thorny issues mm -hmm. around the rights of workers, around what was the role of platforms mm. to protect them. Were people truly contractors? What did they get healthcare? What happened mm. if they had a child? Blah, blah, blah. So I did a lot of that and I chaired this massive government quango for a few years. So I was a sort of queen of the sharing economy and um, as often referred to, or the poster girl for it in the UK. And that I think is another theme for me is um, I've always, this probably goes back to family, felt like you have to stand for something. I mm -hmm. say this all the time to the kids. This is maximum eye roll for my 14 year old. You have to stand for something. And for me, interface with politics and policy. 
and ensuring that the voice of the entrepreneur, the voice of business and the voice of women is heard by policymakers, I think is something that I can do and mm -hmm. encourage others to do. And that was an important part of that time. Yeah. It was fun. We got to stay in lots of houses around the world. Yeah, really cool. I mean, it sounds great. I yeah. also would love to would love to do it. It sounds... You know, also, it's one of these things where it was five years ago that I sold it and every so often something happens somewhere and somebody will say to me, oh my God, I've done 30 love home swaps. We, have, we used to have, have these really extraordinary case studies and continue to do so. People who've figured out how it works and they spent five years traveling the world. Yeah, I can also you know, imagine kind of there amazing. are some people who live almost opposite lives where they want the other person's life just for two weeks a year. It happens like every it. single year. Life swap. Like, like in Provence Completely. or like in the US or whatever it might be. And just like, actually we want to be in that place for a month can't pay for a month of accommodation somewhere or I wouldn't want to pay for a hotel of accommodation somewhere for a month and actually being able to have that swapping. It's huge. We had this family called the, the Prince family because they came in to see me in London and they'd done three, they had four children, they were homeschooling and they'd done three years of just being on the road. Oh my god! Amazing. My new life goal has That's been established. It. That's what you need to do. Apart so yeah, it was a lovely business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lovely business that now does it incredibly well, yeah. because I think even more so post the pandemic, yeah. the sort of nomadic community of, of course. Who is a thing. But yeah, it was it was a great ride. And what were the biggest things that you learned um, from the second business in comparison to the first business? I think we often get, we get told over and over how like every business is so different. Mm -hmm. And I think we kind of think, yeah, but most of the time, you know, the same things will happen. I think there's some stuff I learned and some stuff I seem incapable of learning. Right, yes, um, I'm very good at that one okay. too. So the things I learned were you're just quicker at stuff. Mm -hmm. Raising money is easier mm -hmm. because you've already yeah, done already it. Yeah, already done it, already sold you it. Know, so that bit is easier. Um, you, I've throughout my career had some of the same people around me for quite a lot of what I've done. So I think you kind of get your A team together. Um, Things I never seem to learn and still am really bad at, and I think that this is a real baked-in problem for entrepreneurs, is that you sell the dream, sell the dream, sell the dream to raise the money. You don't have any of the right people to deliver on the plan, and so you hire in a hurry and you cock it up. I do that. I still do it. Yeah. All the time. I've just done it. So I... Maybe that's just like a mental block for me. Yeah. But I think um, a Anna, my um, business partner in Albright, will say, the thing is, if you're always selling the sunlit up plans, I'm really good at that. Like, yeah. give me a pen and I'll sell the pen, right? Yeah. Then I think it doesn't actually make you a great judge of talent mm -hmm. because once you get someone to the point of accepting, particularly if you're making these really aspirational hires, I'm a bit over it by yeah. then, you know what I mean? I'm like, I've done my bit. And also you just want them to start now. And I don't know how to get better at that other than never being trusted to hire anyone on my own. <laughs> but I really, really enjoy that. I think that's really important to know. And it's, it's one of those things where I think we think is probably a non-negotiable in being an entrepreneur, but actually knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, I there are going to be certain things. I need things. someone to, and also, you know what it's like where you you've raised the money and and for all right love host what we raised quite a lot of money and you've got 25 people in yeah. the plan that you need now and so you just go into that yeah. marriage, don't you like yeah and if yeah, you are a yeah. doer it's one of those things that you i mean hiring is something that you cannot just automatically scale like you can't just say we need x amount of people and get x amount of people there's months of delays there's months of the wrong people there's months of like all of these things and if you are a doer and you like to get if you're efficient and you like to get things done and you prioritize efficiency over perfection which is what most entrepreneurs do i'd say you're unlikely to be good at them. No. But it's going to be one of those things you're like but i'm getting it done yeah i'm not i've done it i and can't also, speed it up um, you're a big planner grace as yes I know. and mm. i'm a planner although not in as sophisticated way as you are but i love a list mm. and i love things off the list mm. and i'm like need to hire those people but, 
done that. Yeah. Like, oh my God, they're a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's that. But know? that's also one of your biggest strengths. And I feel like that's the, it's one of those things where it's like, of course, that is a recognized weakness of yours. And you're like, do you know what? I'm not good at this. But I feel like if you were good at that, you wouldn't be as good at being efficient and being kind of just getting shit done when you need to get shit done. And like, you can't always have both. Like there are, there are ways obviously we can hone and perfect, but that's one of your real strengths. I, I think so. And I think what it just shows over and over again is our output is only as collectively brilliant as the people we have around oh, us. And 100%. I think the ability is, particularly over time, you know, what did I learn between business number one and business number four, which is what I just had, is how to say, don't trust me to do that, or yeah. don't bring that to me, and or, or I need X to make sure that I've done that. Also, in the same way as vulnerability is strength, that is one of the biggest strengths. Know it, being self-aware about your weaknesses and also able to be not necessarily self-effacing enough, but like be able to swallow your ego in any moment you need to, to say, I'm not good at that. I think that was a real turning point for me in becoming a good founder and a good leader was actually the fact that I was able to walk into a room and rather than feel like I needed to be decisive in that moment, I'm a very decisive person, but it meant that if I don't didn't know the full facts, I wouldn't want to appear like I didn't know the full facts and therefore would be decisive based on not enough information. And I feel like one of the biggest learnings for me was realizing that I need to be able to go into a room and just be like, actually, I have no idea about that. Could you take me through all of this? And then I can make the decision. I used to think that was weakness. I totally relate to that. And I think one thing I'm definitely better at now is saying, even when I've heard it all, I'm just going to have to think about that. Yeah. I would never, never even if the decision is due I, now. Because I've got another meeting afterwards and another thing afterwards and a mm. thing and a blah, and that's my block to make a decision that actually it isn't. Mm. So you can say, I just need to let it marinate. Yeah. I don't think I ever let anything marinate yeah. when I was younger, and now I do. Yeah, and, and learning that when you're a doer is very and important. And also um, dropping things. Mm. So, um, sort of jumping around a little bit, but I'm sure you'll bring me in between. <laughs> thinking about what next now and, um, you know, we're looking at lots of different things. I think in the past, I found it hard to let something go when I become attached to it. And See, I'm, I'm very good at that. <laughs> I'm desperately looking for um, the business model. Mm -hmm. If I think, if I first thought there was one, right? So I, at, at the moment we're looking We've, we've spent maybe three weeks looking at a particular sector where both of us have gone, we think that's a thing. And we've got to the end of three weeks and we're like, it's not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know that I would have quite, because I would have gone, no, 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 I can find it, I can fix yeah. it. I just need to go and see that person and we can think in the economics and I've got this kind of thing. And I think we're just, and I do a lot of we because Anna really has, changed my life in lots of ways. I've changed hers, although she may wish she'd said in a really sensible job and never met me. But I think that being able to have a relationship and sole founders don't always have this unless yes. they hire really well, where mm -hmm. someone can say, just fucking drop it. Yeah. No. Yeah. And I, I will say that point on sole founders. So I'm a sole founder, but I've always had amazing people around me. Um, and even from the, I would say, not necessarily from right at the beginning, but from the points that it actually got serious, it was kind of like, I actually can't do that, especially because I started this stuff at university. It was like, there's no way I can start this at this scale without having good people around me. But ever since I've had a really, really fantastic managing director who happened to be a match made in heaven from recruitment, it's just, I mean, it's life-changing having someone there who can literally look you in the eye, shake you and go like, yeah. shut the fuck up. Yeah. It's not gonna, Absolutely. you know, like it's yeah, one yeah. of those really, really and important someone things. someone take it from. Yeah, a hundred percent. from anywhere. A hundred percent. So before we get to that and before we get to kind of what's next for you now, how did that feel? First of all, did you set up Love Home Swap knowing you were going to sell it? Yes. yes. I've only ever done things knowing I'm going to sell them. Yeah. I'm all about the selling. Love that. I, I really, really Five love years. that. And I really, I think that there's this, especially on like business podcasts and stuff, the amount of people that sit there and go, and it, it doesn't, it absolutely, this is not me saying that it's then all about the money. It's not at all. Otherwise you wouldn't get up every day, but actually being able to sit there and just be like, no, this is a business and I am aiming to sell it. The aim is to create an incredible business, sell it to the right person and have done that. Like, th I think that's really important, the amount of people who sit there and say like, oh no, don't care well, about I that I think at all. two things on that. I've 
I really admire people, um, and I've met many of them, who have built a business over 20 plus years and then sold it. I've got five years of anything in me and then I'm bored. And I think the, the issue, and perhaps this is a thing around doing B2C, D2C and fronting things up in the way that you do and I have done. In the end, you feel like a stand-up comedian in need of some new material, like mm -hmm. to the point on the movie The Holiday. I mean, it, it's fine now because it's sort of clear blue water, but during that time when someone will go, how did you come up with the idea? And I feel like, if I have to do this again, I'm just gonna... So I think you, you come to a point as a storyteller mm -hmm. where the story either needs to change or you need to change the story that you're telling. And, and then back to the point of have fun, make money, don't work with assholes. Can we please make some money, mm -hmm. right? Can we not stay in a business forever and ever and ever, not paying ourselves properly, with investors, with a screwed up cap table? I mean, Grace, I've seen so many women's businesses where it's just a mess and I have to sit with them and say, what are you getting out of this? What do you think, what do you want, what do you... And I think that entrepreneurship can be the most amazing path to upside, um, personal fulfillment, being in the world and getting rich. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget to talk about that last bit. Mm. And I think, yes, there are different ways of doing it, but my, to date anyway, I have conventionally started a business, raised external finance, owned less of the business than I did at the beginning, sold part of the business or all of the business to make money. If that's the cadence, and, and I know not all of your businesses are like that, but if that is the cadence, you're not making much money as you go along. Mm -hmm. So make sure that there are some moments, otherwise you're stuck. And I've yeah. seen a lot of people get stuck. Yeah, no, I think that is very powerful. And when you when you got that offer from Wyndham, had you gone out and about to try and to look for offers or was were there kind of ones that came in and then you started exploring? It, it was a, a different situation because they were investors in the business. Right. So they had invested two years before we actually sold with an option to buy the business. So I felt pretty confident two years before the okay. sale that they would buy, but I didn't know where, when and how much. Yeah. Part of the reason to do it that way was specific to that business actually, and I think there's also a point in there maybe somewhere that's useful. Sometimes the business you end up growing is not the business you think you founded at the beginning, that was mostly the case. And mm -hmm. what we ended up really scaling was something that felt a bit like a modern day timeshare and needed a call center type network to sell the product. So what became clear when we were raising our Series B was that we didn't just need money, we needed access to inventory and systems. So when we raised, it was more the step before when we raised that round, we, we mostly spoke to strategics and that was the right thing to do because it absolutely accelerated the growth of the business between those two stages because we were able to plug into um, call centers and actually, when I founded Love Home Swap on the plane and there, at no moment then did I think, I'm growing a timeshare. I don't even know what timeshare yeah. was really. But I think when you're in the business, and I think this is another big um, theme for me, is that all of the best things that have happened in my life have been because of people that I've met. Mm -hmm. My mother's version of that would be, you're never going to meet the man of your dreams in your kitchen. She's right. Um, but I think no, no also... Um, it, Serendipity is a beautiful thing. And the wind and serendipity thing was exactly that, in that I was, I somehow found myself at the European timeshare conference because they'd asked me to speak and I went and I met the person. So my point is that it's partly why the pandemic was so hard mm. that we didn't have these moments of serendipity, but don't underestimate the power of chance encounters to shape a business. And that, that was definitely a big part of the story of that business. And how did it feel when you actually sold that? I mean, you sold it for a lot of money. Yeah. Um, it was incredibly successful. How did that feel? amazing and weird yeah that's how it always feels mm -hmm. because um it's been your life mm -hmm. it's been your baby it's not that i felt emotionally attached to the concept of home shopping for the rest of my life so i didn't <laughs> um i mean like it's great but i didn't it's very weird to leave anything mm. 
It's weird to leave an office. It's weird to leave a team. You definitely, at every stage, and it's what I'm going through now, have an existential crisis. Yes, I can imagine. Right? Who am I? What's the point? I think also, you and I both like a schedule, and a lot of that schedule is driven by output team. Like, when that goes, and you're sort of like, what do I do? I have to create my own busyness. AJ will yes. always say, we're brand busy. Like, that's part of our personal brand. It is yeah. part of yours, like structure and busy. Mm. When that goes, you can feel quite empty. And I think that's something that a lot of my peers and friends who have sold businesses talk about, that um, another friend who's a very successful founder said, <laughs> has always said to me at these moments, you know, it's an artificial construct that we've created in our lives to give it meaning. And he's sort of right in a way, which is the whole purpose of your life that becomes home swapping or yeah. athleisure or yeah. people's fitness plans or whatever. And of course, that isn't the whole purpose of your life, but it can really fill a day yeah. with meaning and purpose. So when you lose that, you feel adrift. And people who are brand busy with focus, who like output and who likes getting to bed at night thinking, well, I achieved this, this, yeah. this, 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 that it's very unsettling. Mm. So it felt like all of those things. I mean, my bank account felt great. Like yeah. I bought a big house and I'm not, you yeah, know, you yeah, should yeah. talk about that stuff. But um, transitions are weird. Can't imagine home shopping for the first time it's after weird. having. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, like, it's amazing. Waltzing, waltzing through the house, yeah. like. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, all those things. Yeah, and it do, uh, so I'm assuming you never ever thought, okay, that was it. That's no. the that's the career. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not getting that energy from you. <laughs> no, got to stand for something. How long did it take? Oh, well, no, it wasn't even like that. I mean, this is a bit crazy, but again, serendipity is a thing. So six months before I sold, at the beginning of 2017, I went to a party of, that I nearly didn't go to of some parents of the my eldest child's school and the father said to me the summer night I think you should meet and what he was doing I think was he knew two female CEOs who were yeah. it was like, like rare kiss yeah. <laughs> seriously that's what happened and that was Anna <laughs> so ridiculous and so it was that the summer night I want you to meet and we really Amy really got on she's great and we bonded a lot over life, universe, everything, our kids were the same age. She's also a nor northerner, although her accents, she, I'm much posher than she is, as I like to remind her. Um, yeah, and so for the few months after that, um, we would meet for cocktails or breakfast, mostly cocktails, and sort of put the world to rights. But out of that came a real theme, and Anna had had a totally different career to mine, very elegant, as she is as a person, she, you know, gone from being a graduate trainee really at Hearst to being the CEO in her mid thirties. And she's a really extraordinary person. But the theme for both of us was, where are all the women? Like with exactly the same age, there are no more women now than when we started. However you cut the pie, whether that's female founders getting funded, women writing checks, if there's a gender pay gap, there's a gender savings gap, women do like, Blah, 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 all of that. And in Anna's world, she was the only female CEO of a media business in the UK. It's one in six in leadership positions. The glass ceiling was extremely manifest in her life. So uh, over that, and we were in um, a private members club, um, and on the back of a cocktail menu, we scribbled this project Albright after the Madeline quote that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Because that had been a big thing for us that we, that's how both of us are as mm. people. But also we felt very strongly that there was nothing that existed that was um, a replacement in any way for the old boys club. And we right. had been around the old boys club for all of our professional lives. Yes. I was so used to being the only woman in the room, I didn't even notice anymore. I'd only ever pitch to men for money. That's a weird thing if you think about it hard enough. Um, and so Albright was born off the back of this uh, premise that we could combine purpose with profit, always profit, and that we could create a monster global sisterhood of amazing diverse women and build a business around that. Mm. So well, on the day I sold Love Home Swap, oh, 
That was the nice thing. <laughs> and, eight, and I went to Ibiza. I was actually in Ibiza, which is where I go every summer. I've been going there since I was 18 in different guises. And um, I, the deal, the Love Home sort of deal ended up being leaked to Sky and it all got accelerated. So I had to Once it had already happened? Like, no, it hadn't quite closed. Oh, God, it was really so stressful. stressful. So I had to fly back. And, and then it all got signed on the, the day that I arrived back, although I actually couldn't even get a flight off the island. I ended up sprinting through Barcelona Airport. And anyway, oh my God. very so stressful. And then when I went back and it was done, AJ came out, she always comes out in the summer, and it was all on. So, no, I didn't, I mean, I really didn't have any downtime. No, that was a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But also, Albright has been the last five years of my life and it's been amazing and awful in equal measure and I do I, of course sometimes I thought God, why don't I have a break I'm seriously sometimes I need my head looking at but if if people places and things give you energy then when you meet the right people and ideas emanate then you're sort of compelled to follow them yeah and so you've recently announced that you've sold yes from Albright yes could you tell me a little bit more about the the plan now and also the what that journey was like? I know obviously it's a business that perhaps more than home swapping, you obviously feel so passionately yes. about. So the process of kind of stepping away from that and the difference between that and you know how it was last time. It's different. Mm -hmm. Some similarities, but it's different. I think Albright, um, has been all about us and our purpose and so that does feel differently mm -hmm. to moving on from home swapping because we're not moving on from being women who care about women's networks mm -hmm. we're not moving on from being women who invest in other women we're not, you know lots sure. of that stuff is yeah. still brand us um but the business itself had been through extraordinary times i mean that business grew so fast, so quickly, between 2017 and 2019, we raised a lot of capital. There were businesses springing up, particularly in the US, like The Wing, which was different to us, but you know, it, it set, I think, a tone around having these conversations, some of which were controversial around what it meant to be a woman in business. And then the pandemic zeroed our revenues overnight, literally zeroed them. We had been on this um, adrenaline-driven, sort of mad journey of uh, opening members clubs in the US. I was flying out to LA twice a month, Christ. which really killed me and really screwed up my health, but we're kind of on a mission. And the business was really flying. And then as happened to so many people in so many different ways, but particularly a business that had so much exposure to physical space, right. it was like, oh my God. Now, like, do we just go bust? Like, is this the end of our sort of glorious track record? But I suppose, again, pivot. There wasn't even pivot. It was like, right, number one, our community really needs us. People are hurting. They don't know what to do. The average age of an Albright member in the physical spaces is mid-30s. A lot of people had kids and they were homeschooling. The digital platform was younger. But we were all stuck, as you know. So we move very quickly or sort of overnight into um, being in people's living rooms. We every single day did ask me anything and loads of in conversations. We the digital platform was due to launch in uh, June of 2020 and we went into lockdown in March. So we had to just launch it in March mm -hmm. and it wasn't great. Finished. We already had it underway yeah, then. I mean it was really right. but we did it and we got it out and then we did it and we were able to pivot totally reinvent the business into a, a digital subscription platform, which you will recognize into commercial partnerships around digital content, into a leadership and development program that can be delivered digitally. It was so hard, Grace. Mm. Um, and the public facing aspect of it, which you will relate to, um, there were some days where I didn't really want to be asked anything. I didn't really want to put my face on and sit on Instagram Live or whatever, you know. It, so it was a really tough, amazing, extraordinary time. As we came out of the pandemic, buildings reopened, the business was, you know, performing extremely well, but it felt like towards the end of last year, 
that there was an opportunity to do something that people generally don't do, which is to plan succession and to plan succession for an all female leadership team. And that felt like something that we could do that was really different, that we could sell some of our shares. We still remain shareholders in the business, but that there was a way through and onto the next stage of our personal journey that didn't involve being there until the bitter end and did involve empowering women yeah. to take on a business that still had a life and a shelf life and for us to have a different role as non-execs of that business. So that's what we've been working on this year. So back to how do I feel after Love Home Swap? Weird. Yeah. And I think even weirder with this business um, because there was so much of us in it, but also super happy for the team, which is a combination of people who were there and people we brought in, really happy for the community, cheering everybody on from the sidelines and as proud shareholders, but sort of on to the next thing. That's so exciting. Well, I actually think that's a perfect place to, to end. I feel like that's shared. I mean, I personally can't wait to see the reality of what the next things are. Um, but I mean, your story is just incredible and I really appreciate how open you are about it all. And I think that it frames a very important conversation for a lot of women. So I'm excited for everyone to listen. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs>